Welcome back to Wrong Sports as I continue my journey through the 1950-51 college football seasons where there were a lot of things happening, a lot of changes happening, and a lot of scandals that would be happening. And in this next episode, I'll be going over another scandal. And this will be the second time on this channel that I'll be covering the Army football team from the 1940s and 50s and the continuation of this five-part series. In the first part, I cover the 1950 college football season. In my second part, I cover the William and Mary academic scandal. And while that scandal was really seedy as well and covered academics, this next scandal was also in the academic realm, but not nearly as seedy as that William and Mary scandal. The Army West Point football team of the 1940s was amazing with two Heisman winners and several undefeated seasons. But behind the scenes, there was a massive cheating scandal going on that covered several years of cadets and ripped apart Army football for the next few years. But before I get into that, I want you to quickly go below and subscribe to the channel. Also, ring the bell as well so you can get updates on brand new videos. Also, check out my podcast, my Patreon, and my social media in the description below. And as always, like and share this video with other college sports fans. I have mentioned earlier that I have done several videos about Army and their great football teams of the 1940s, so I won't be doing a huge backstory about their amazing run. You can see that in the upper right-hand corner and also in the playlist to the sides. I will quickly explain that Army started playing football in 1890 and quickly became one of the top teams in college football, as they won the national title in 1914 and 1916. With them being made up of cadets at West Point, Army football was seen as America's team, especially with World War I and World War II happening over the next three decades. The Army football team would become even bigger and a sign of America's success during World War II with their unbeaten run between 1943 and 1947 and then doing it again from 1948 until December 1950. The streak would end right where the scandal would start, though, in December 1950, after Army's shocking upset loss to Navy. The loss was huge as it picked at Army's wall of invincibility, but that wall would come crumbling down just a few months later. Of course, academic integrity is something that all universities and colleges strive for, but at West Point, it wasn't just academic integrity, it was honor that you had to have. You not only had to do your schoolwork, but do everything else that comes with the Army experience. Along with that, you also had to agree to Army's honor code, and I'll explain more about that later. But if you were a cadet at West Point, you were juggling both. And if you were an athlete, you had to juggle both of those, along with doing everything else you had to do on the field to win. And in case you don't know, West Point is known to be a tough school to get into and then go through. But if you make it through, West Point offers a lot of rewards that you can't get anywhere else, since only a select few make it to West Point. Along with that, West Point also offers jobs and assignments in the Army that would protect you from combat or the front lines. This last thing was very significant for college-age men in the 1940s as World War raged on. And if you wanted to avoid going right into combat or become an officer, you wanted to get into West Point during the 1940s. Because of this great position that the Army was in, they would get all the great athletes in the 1940s who were looking to avoid World War II, and they would continue to get those great athletes after World War II was over and into the 1950s. But once you got into West Point, you knew that the academic requirements were tough, and they got to a lot of cadets. And if you were failing a class, you could be suspended or worse, expelled from the academy. And this doesn't look good when you get expelled from any university or college, but West Point had students all over the country. And if you were someone going to West Point, you were well known in your community. On top of that, you needed a congressman to write a letter for you to get into West Point. So not only would your community know, but your representative would know you too. But for athletes, especially on the football teams, these academic requirements and the other rigors of army life could trip you up and cause you to miss time on the field. And if you were an athlete that was suspended for a game during the 1940s of army football, you could never see the field again due to the amount of talent they had on that team. An example being Glenn Davis, who came to West Point in 1943 as a freshman and had some trouble in the classroom, and it resulted in him not seeing a lot of the field until 1944. It was lucky for him that Coach Red Blake saw his talent and kept him on the field and also switched his position in 1944 to halfback, resulting in him and Army going unbeaten for the next three years and also Davis winning the Heisman too. And I mentioned Davis' story of his academic troubles because it wasn't a rare thing for a cadet or an athlete to need a tutor to pass a class. 
but when a tutor wasn't enough, you could ask for extra help. So this is the part where I talk about the scheme or the scandal, which I'll be getting a lot from news reports, but also I'm getting a lot of this information from the 2005 ESPN movie Codebreakers, which was all about the scandal, but also added a little bit of commercial drama in there. I won't be mentioning that though. But the academic scheme was basically what most people would call a crib note scheme, and this entailed working as a group to remember questions on exams and write them down for future test takers. And the scheme was explained pretty well in the ESPN movie, as the main character went to his first period, which was an English class, and took the test, all while remembering the questions on the exam. He would then get back to his dorm room and write all the questions that he remembered and then gave them to another member in this scheme. Those questions would then go to other cadets that were going to be taking the test in the future, and then they would know the questions before they took the test. The main character then in return got answers for a future exam of another subject he'd take, and and it helped out his academic standard. It isn't clear though how many cadets over the years were involved in this scheme or for how long it was going on, so this crib note scheme could have been going on since the early 1940s, and many players believe that Coach Earl Red Blake knew about it, but turned a blind eye because he wanted to make sure his players stayed eligible. And I mentioned Coach Earl Blake and how he shouldn't be completely innocent, as he knew how hard it was to be a cadet, student, and football player at Army. Because he was one. Earl Blake was born in Detroit and stayed in the Midwest for college as he went to play at Miami of Ohio from 1915 to 1917. After 1917, Blake was accepted by West Point and would play on the football team for the 1918 and 1919 season, being a third-team All-American in 1919. He would graduate just months after World War I ended and would get into coaching, first going to Dartmouth where he won 70% of his games from 1934 to 1940. And because of his great run at a good Eastern school, his alma mater called and he would accept the Army head coaching job in 1941. And as soon as Blake started coaching, America would pretty much be thrust into World War II, and the Army football team was looked at as America's team. And Blake was under pressure to win games, and he never had a losing season from 1941 to 1943, but they couldn't beat their top rivals in Navy and Notre Dame during this time, so it wasn't really looked upon as a winning record. The team would get a much-needed talent infusion in 1943 with Glenn Davis and then Doc Blanchard shortly after, and that would give Blake the talent he needed to win. As from 1944 to 1949, the Army team went 49-2-4, but during that time, Army would get complaints from other teams, like Michigan and most notably Notre Dame, about Army's tough and potentially dirty play. Notre Dame would be angry enough to stop playing Army altogether after 1947, and this hurt Army's chances for a national title after that point. The dirty and rough play could be attributed to Blake's coaching style and his hard-nosed playing style, but it was also due to the pressure that he was under to win, and the pressure that he put on his cadets as well. That pressure to play and win could be contributed to this cheating scandal happening, as Blake knew of everything his players were doing, since, you know, it is the army and everything is pretty scheduled and regimen there. Plus, by 1946, the Army coaching staff was a great job to have, and some noteworthy assistants like Murray Warmuth, he was the future Wisconsin coach, Doug Kenna, the former Army quarterback that won titles in 1944 and 1945, and none other than Vince Lombardi were assistants on this coaching staff. But again, there is no proof that Blake knew of the cheating or any assistants knew, but they knew of the academic standing of all their players, so it wasn't hard to know who needed help more than others. The scandal would finally come to the public in the spring of 1951. After several weeks of West Point interrogating cadets, they concluded that upwards of 90 cadets broke the honor code. And I'm not 100% certain as to how the Army higher-ups found out about the whole cheating scandal, but if you watch the Code Breakers movie, all it took was one cadet telling on his roommate that started the investigation. There was also another story in a Sports Illustrated article about the scandal where an unnamed athlete had heard about the scheme, and even though he wasn't a part of it due to the honor code on the West Point campus, he had to tell on them or he'd be breaking the honor code himself. So you can see how having the honor code on the West Point campus and instilling that in all the cadets immediately would scare off these cheating schemes from happening. Unfortunately, it didn't here. 
and after the Army Chief of Staff got wind on how far wide the cheating went, he wanted to make sure that it would never happen again, and announced that 83 cadets would be discharged from West Point. The reason was because it embarrassed West Point that this many were cheating and breaking the honor code, that something had to be done. Some more factors were that the war in Korea wasn't going so well in 1950-51 as the graduating class from West Point in 1949 went over there and many were killed. Example being Army's 1949 Captain Johnny Trent, I mentioned that in my previous How the Year Was Won 1950 video. So West Point wanted to make sure they were graduating the best men and squashing this whole cheating scandal was the best thing to do. On top of that, in April 1951, General Douglas MacArthur, America's top general and huge nationwide celebrity, would be relieved of his duties. He was relieved mostly due to massive losses in Korea and for provoking China into fighting in Korea. And I don't want to get into all of that, but MacArthur's resignation from the army was huge, as in 1948, he was rumored as running for president and was pretty guaranteed to win again due to his successes in World War II. MacArthur leaving army was also also a huge blow to coach Red Blake, as the two men were very good friends, as MacArthur was a lover of football, but due to him being a little too small, he never played. But he would often talk to Blake about the football team and help to get certain athletes to West Point to play football. With West Point being embarrassed by the scandal, MacArthur leaving, things in Korea not going well, it would get worse as dozens of football players were off the team due to the scandal, and many thought that that would spell the end to Army football. Some well-known names would be forced to leave West Point as well. One big one was Al Pollard, who was Army's leading rusher and scorer in 1950. And according to the book When Pride Still Mattered, Pollard was going to have a huge Heisman campaign in 1951 to get him to be a Heisman finalist. Another top player that was off the team due to the scandal was Army's starting quarterback and the coach's son, Bob Blake. He was going into his final year at West Point, and him being caught in the scheme only made this whole mess look even worse. With dozens of players leaving, Coach Blake was about to hang it up as well. But he was stopped by MacArthur, who talked him into coming back and building a new team. But it wasn't going to be easy, as the Army Chief of Staff General said he wanted an Army football team in 1951 with the schedule they have, and he didn't care if they lost 100 to nothing. And here's an interesting story, as with the announcement of the players being kicked out of West Point happening on August 3rd, the players wouldn't have much time to find a new school. Luckily though, they were helped out by none other than Joe Kennedy, the father of John F. Kennedy, our future president, and a former ambassador to the UK in the 1930s. He helped to get some cadets into new schools, such as Bob Blake, who went to Colorado College. But some of the cadets that were kicked out would also go pro, like Al Pollard, couldn't find another college to go to, and made himself eligible to be drafted, and was in the 21st round by the New York Yanks, but didn't play much, and actually played a little bit in the CFL. So with one month to get his makeshift team of cadets ready for the season, Red Blake would be on the sidelines coaching them for the 1951 season. Now, the team wasn't going to have much of a chance due to their talent loss, and they would show that as they would lose their first four games. But three of them were by one possession, so they were keeping it close with teams. After that, they would beat Columbia and the Citadel, but limped to the finish as they got crushed by the Navy 49-7, showing just how much the cheating scandal hurt them and that talent loss hurt them. The Army football team would take until 1953 to be themselves again, as they went 7-1-1, one one, beating Army that year too, but it wasn't the same. Coaching and recruiting really good athletes to Army would be harder and harder for Coach Blake, as there would be no world war and no need for millions of men to join the armed forces. Also without that, West Point couldn't provide a getaway from the front lines of war to athletes, as athletes could go to any university or college now and avoid war. Because of this, Army would never get to the levels they did in World War II, but they would have their best season in 1958 as they went 9-0-1-1 and had the Heisman winner Pete Dawkins. Army wasn't voted national champion that year, and it would be the swan song for Earl Blake as well, as he would retire and never coach again after that season. 
1951 scandal does hang over his head, but because the army was able to quiet down a lot of what came out, it doesn't look so bad. So we don't really know how bad the cheating went, if it was just the so-called crib note scandal, or if there was a lot more that went down. This scandal and the one I mentioned in the previous episode from William & Mary shows just how pressurized college football got after World War II. Since we had many players from colleges all over the country and from the armed forces looking to cheat to stay on the field and in college and also make a little money too in the case of the William & Mary. I don't think any cadets made any money in this scheme. But these big cheating scandals, and especially this last one, really changed college recruiting as it forced coaches to recruit athletes that could actually get into the school. And supposedly they started to care more about academics than they did athletics and put a few more requirements to get athletes into the school. The talent pool for college athletics also changed a lot too, as Army could no longer get anyone they wanted to come play. As their academic requirements, they also had height and weight requirements as well that became even more stringent in the future. But thank you so much for hanging out with me in part three of my five-part series I'll be doing all about the college football seasons of 1950 and 1951. The next episode will not be about an academic scandal. It will be about a racial and a violence scandal. It's all about Johnny Bright. I hope you join me for that one. Also, if you like this, please like the video below. Also, I'll share this video with other college football fans. Also, make sure you check out my Patreon, my podcast, and my social media links in the description below. And of course, subscribe to the channel as well below and have a fantastic day.